Hello, and welcome to another edition of Coffee Talk with Immigration Attorney Brian D. Lerner. As many of you know, the date to file the H-1Bs is up and coming. Uh, we can send them all off April 1st for receipt on April 2nd. And in the past few years, <coughs> especially when the, um, when the economy wasn't so good, uh, H-1Bs weren't used up. Uh, as quickly, and in some years, in fact, th they went the whole year <clears throat> without using all of the H-1Bs at all. Uh, and uh, that, that was honestly a, a good marker of how the economy was doing. Uh, but the economy is getting better, and the H-1Bs are getting used quicker. Uh, and so, at this point, you ought to probably be aware that you want to get your H-1B into uh, the system right when it opens so that you have a decent chance at getting uh, an adjudication on the H-1B and not getting it returned. Uh, believe me, if you don't get it in in time and they return your application say, sorry, try again next year, uh, your whole plans for what you were planning on doing here in the United States will change and it could delay things for a long time. So do what you need to do, get the employer and get the petition filed. It's, there's a lot of stuff involved with an H-1B, which I actually have other videos uh, discussing in detail, but I thought I would hit on uh, one particular issue in this, this video on the H-1Bs, and that's referred to as the cap gap. Now, what is the cap gap? What does it mean? Well, before the laws came out alleviating the problems with cap gap, what would happen is, let's say, for example, uh, somebody applies for an H-1B as whatever, you know, an electrical engineer, and they're going to graduate in June. Uh, so let's say that the H-1B is submitted on April uh, 2nd, so they get in, and of course when an H-1B is submitted, uh, the earliest start date will be the following October, assuming it's for that year's allotment. So, before the regulations and laws came out on cap gaps, what would happen is this engineer, uh, you know, who submitted the petition, uh, would have to leave the country, and then would have to process through the, the you know, consular post to get the H-1B, and then come back, uh, assumably if it was all uh, approved. And of course, this created significant hardship to do this, especially when the, there's the status has lapsed between the summer and October when the new H-1B will start. Uh, and, and usually it's just a matter of two months, three months, uh, some short period. So what the cap gap does is it actually allows certain students that have pending or approved H-1Bs to remain in F-1 status during the time when the F-1 status or the work authorization pendant to the uh, F-1 status would have expired. That is the gap, okay? That's the gap we're talking about. And what these laws do is it fills in the cap gap with these regulations, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, um, will uh, occur when the degree is uh, finished, when the school's finished, yet before the H-1B starts. So there's two statuses you need to be concerned with when dealing with the cap gap, uh, F-1 and H-1B. So F-1 is, you know, when someone is on student status and H-1B is, of course, the specialty occupation work visa. And that's the way the normal progression works once people come in the U.S. They come in on an F-1, they go as long as they have to to go to school to get the degree, and then they apply for an H-1B. And because the cap gap has been uh, fixed, basically, uh, and I'll, I'll get into some specifics here, <clears throat> but because it's been fixed, they basically can go straight from F-1 to H-1B, have a little gap in between, but not worry about a lapse in status, and then uh, assuming everything's approved, start their new job on H-1B come the following October 1st. So, with that in mind, um, let's go over some 
some issues with the cap gap. So uh, I already just discussed in some detail, but, but how does the cap gap occur specifically? Well, uh, you know, an, an employer may not file and USCIS may not accept an H-1B petition more than six months in advance of the date of actual need for the person's services. So, you know, even if you know that you're going to have an employer petition you for the H-1B, you can't hop into the prior year's allotment uh, and say, well, you want to start a year and a half or two years from that point, only six months. So that really does limit and leave you to having to apply uh, when the doors open on April uh, 1st uh, for the following October. So, you know, as, as a result, if, if USCIS approves the H-1B petition and the accompanying change of status request, then again, the earliest that you would be able to, to work is October 1st. So, remember, one key issue here is you must apply for a change of status to H-1B. Not, not consular processing. Uh, you do consular processing, no cap gap for you. You will be out of status, and that'll be a big mistake. So make sure it's a change of status. Now, uh, the F1 students whose periods of authorized stay expire before October 1st, 2012, um, and who do not qualify for a cap gap extension, they are required to leave the United States and they are required to get the H-1B at the consular post and seek readmission to the United States at that time. So the, the issue becomes uh, which petitions and beneficiaries qualify for a cap gap extension. Uh, you don't want to play around here. You don't want to, you know, just say, well, because I'm an F1, I fall under uh, the cap gap uh, beneficiary and therefore automatic extension, and that's not the case. Um, basically, what you want to look at is that H-1B petitions that are timely filed on behalf of eligible F-1 students and request a change of status to H-1B on October 1st, 2012, that's the bottom line. Those are the people who qualify for a cap gap extension, okay? And uh, once it is properly filed, then uh, their status is automatically extended. So the, there's also what's known as a, as a grace period, okay? Uh, normally when F1 uh, expires, and also depending on OPT, which is op optical, optional practical training, when that expires, there's a 60-day period upon which the student has to depart, and that's known as the grace period. And uh, if the uh, H-1B is denied, is not adjudicated because you know they ran out of H-1Bs or is revoked for some manner, uh, then uh, the, the question becomes, well, what if they do deny it? Does that mean you've been out of status the whole time while you were waiting? And the answer is no. Uh, you still get the extension, but once it would be denied, once you have notice of that denial, then you will be able to have 60 days thereafter in which to depart the United States where you won't have any unlawful presence or out of status issues uh, as long as you do uh, count the 60 days from the time of the denial or the uh, revocation uh, or the non-adjudication. Again, the, the way non-adjudication comes in is you have 65,000 H-1Bs per year, which may sound like a ton, but we're talking the United States here, and also there's some that are uh, directed uh, specifically to persons from other countries like Chile and Hong Kong and so forth. And so uh, they go very quickly. And as, as I stated, when the economy gets better, the H-1Bs go faster, and the economy is getting better, so don't, don't wait on it this year. Now, let's say that you've done everything that, that I've said. You've, you've filed the H-1B when you should, you've asked for the change of status, you were on F-1 that was expiring, and let's say you qualify for the cap gap extension. How do you have proof of that? Because as you know, you know, you could be driving down you know, Broadway uh, with a broken tail light and get stopped by a policeman, and of course they're going to want to have some evidence of your status. Uh, so how do you prove that you are under a cap gap extension? Well, 
first you would go to the DSO. Now if you're on an F1, which is for students, you know what the DSO is. That's the designated school official that deals with everybody who's an F1 status. What you need is evidence that the H1B was uh, petition was filed uh, indicating a request for a change of status. Uh, and you should have a copy of the H-1B petition with you. You should have a copy of the receipt from FedEx or UPS or U USPS Express. I would suggest UPS or FedEx uh, as the best manner because they, they always uh, get their petitions there and, and in order to get signed. Um, you would want to have the, uh, those items with you in order to uh, show that you have status. Now, when you show this, for example, to the police officer to who's ever stopping you, um, they may not understand what it is you're exactly showing them, but just tell them that the, this filing of the H-1B, uh, the proof that it was filed for a change of status, and then of course you can show them your I-94, show them the F-1 status. All of this uh, puts you under an automatic extension under the cap gap mm -hmm. and that hopefully will be sufficient. Now, as, as, uh, as I stated before, um, you, you, you need to make sure that even if it's denied, uh, that you're out within the 60 days. So, you know, there are people who want to have summer vacations back in their home country and so forth who fall under this cap gap. So, so if let's say that they leave, um, or can they leave? Can someone who's on a cap gap extension leave and return to the U.S. in F1 status prior to changing to H1B? And the simple answer to that is no. Um, you know, go vacation in Las Vegas or Hawaii. Um, you cannot leave the United States because if you do, you will have lost your status and you will need to, again, go to the U.S. consulate, do that type of processing for the H-1B and then come in on that manner. So uh, if you're going to leave during a cap gap period, uh, you better be prepared to extend your leave and go to the consulate around September for your interview for the H-1B to come in in October, okay? Um, now. <clears throat> the there there is uh, some other issues. For example, um, there is a normally a 90-day limitation on unemployment during the initial post-completion optional practical training authorization. And the question is, does that 90-day limit on unemployment apply if you're in the cap gap extension period? And yes, it does. Okay. Uh, so there's there's a lot that's the same, and uh, uh, it. You know, thankfully, the particular regulations and uh, laws which issued were issued by the CapGap -Cap, uh, do make it so that people who are in F1, who have limited sources of funds, and who it would be a great hardship to be have to leave the country and try to come back in H1B. Um, all these laws have taken care of that. Um, but make sure everything is processed right. So, you know, two pieces of advice here. Get this H-1B done and out the door um, so it, it arrives at USCIS on April 2nd. And then make sure that you get the necessary proof from the DSO and make sure that you are under the cap gap if you're going to stay here. You don't want to be in a situation where that doesn't occur. Now, now one other thing. Let's say that you apply for the H-1B, but then the employer says, sorry, I don't want you anymore, and withdraws the petition. Can you go back to F-1 status? Well, the answer is yes, you can go back to F-1 status if the withdrawal of the H-1B occurs before it is approved, okay? If the H-1B is approved before the withdrawal, then, of course, it can't, at that point, you can't just automatically go back to F-1. So then you have to then file to reinstate your F-1, file petition for reinstatement, and then uh, assuming that's approved and when it's approved, then you go back to F-1 status. Okay, so uh, that'll take care of um, the cap gap issues. Uh, don't forget to like uh, my videos, to subscribe as well, so you get notification of my new videos. I do uh, try to put out one or two a week. Uh, until the end of time. That's how much immigration laws there are uh, and issues. And uh, we'll, we'll have more videos in the near future.